Welcome, everybody. This is the Rex monthly check-in call on Wednesday, July 11th, 2018. As usual, we have a poem this morning. Uh, Fletcher May is going to read it for us, if you would. The poem is entitled, Who Burns for the Perfect... The poem is entitled, Who Burns for the Perfection of Paper, by Martin Espada. At 16, I worked after high school hours at a printing plant. The manufactured... Le See, I haven't finished my coffee yet. I apologize. It's too early for lecture for a reading. Go for it. At 16... <laughs> I worked after high school hours at a printing plant that manufactured legal pads, yellow paper stacked seven feet high and leaning as I slipped cardboard between the pages, then brushed red glue up and down the stack. No gloves, fingertips required for the perfection of paper, smoothing the exact rectangle. Sluggish by 9 p.m., the hands would slide along suddenly sharp paper and gather slits thinner than the crevices of the skin, hidden. The glue would sting hands oozing, till both palms burned at the punch clock. Ten years later, in law school, I knew that every legal pad was glued with the sting of hidden cuts, that every open law book was a pair of hands upturned and burning. Whoa! i read this again. Yeah. Who burns for the perfection of paper? At 16... I worked after high school hours at a printing plant that manufactured legal pads. Yellow paper stacked seven feet high and leaning as I slipped cardboard between the pages, then brushed red glue up and down the stack. No gloves, fingertips required for the perfection of paper, smoothing the exact rectangle. Sluggish by 9 p.m., the hands would slide along suddenly sharp paper and gather slits thinner than the crevices of the skin, hidden. The glue would sting, hands oozing till both palms burned at the punch clock. Ten years later, in law school, I knew that every legal pad was glued with the sting of hidden cuts, that every open law book was a pair of hands, upturned and burning. That was Who Burns for the Perfection <clears throat> of Paper by Martin Espada. Where did you find that, Jerry? <clears throat> That's good. That's uh, in my collection of poems. Uh, that's actually at the uh, Library of Congress. Uh, mm -hmm. It's part of a collection of, that Billy Collins put together uh, called Poetry 180. He's got two books out, uh, which is like 180 and then another 180. Uh, that's 180 poems. And they're good. They're very good. Lots of, lots of good poetry out there. <clears throat> and it feels like at the end when you read that, Jimmy, I feel like we should then pan back and you should be there smoking in black and white like Rod, <laughs> like Rod Serling. And then we enter the fantasy of our episode. <clears throat> um, greetings, everybody. Welcome to uh, our Rex check-in. This uh, is just an informal call where we figure out where we are, what we're working on, what's up. Um, and uh, and any, would anybody like to just start by checking in? What kind of Rexy things are any of us up to? Come on, Jamey, check in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm, I'm happy to talk. I just have, <clears throat> I'm not doing anything particularly Rexy at the moment. Um, the, the writing on um, Future of Trust for IFTF, I'm, I'm done with that project. Um, although one of the last pieces I wrote for it was on the, the uh, the connection between international power, international politics, and trust, and trying to figure out uh, what's the right approach, you know, other than just you know, going ah. Um, and so, actually, I ended up get, doing a little exploration of the difference between anarchy and chaos. You know, in classic international politics theory. Uh, the global the global condition is that of anarchy. There is no international hierarchy of power. You know, every entity is a power unto itself and is responsible for its own security. Um, and that is that does not necessarily imply chaos. You know, we know that from our own work here. You know, this kind of stuff that we do. We know that you can develop organizational structure 
without an organizational model. That is, you can, you know, I think uh, Bob Johansson is talking about organization, organizing without organizations. Um, open source, uh, all of these kinds of bottom-up movements where you are, you know, essentially developing rules, developing guidelines, developing a, a structured a, a structure of action without having to have an, a hierarchy, hierarchy of control. We're seeing that in reality, and that really is a uh, parallels what what the conventional model of the international structure uh, is. You contrast that with chaos, where your chaos is the lack of that rule set. Um, you know the the lack of the ability to make reasonable projections of what somebody else will do. You know, and what we're seeing right now is not so much that the world is anarchic, I and mean, it's always been anarchic, what we're seeing is the intentional application of chaos as a way of undermining the power of others, um, undermining the security of others. And since the whole thing is around trust, what chaos does, trust in the international system is predicated upon the ability to um, understand and see and be able to successfully expect what you, what you're, other, what other, others are going to do. I can trust you because I have a very good understanding of what you're likely to do next. We understand each other, and that is the nature of trust at the international level. What, by, by undermining the, the capacity to behave in expected ways, you're undermining, that's how you undermine trust. That's how you, in, you inculcate chaos. And chaos is dangerous because um, a lot of our security rests upon being able to figure out what we're going to do based on what we know the others are going to do. North Korea is actually a very trustable regime, not because they're good guys, but because they historically behave in very expected ways. You know, nobody who specialized in North Korea was at all surprised to, to hear um, the North Korean government talk about Pompeo as, as a gangster a week ago, you know, after, you know, after the incredibly successful meeting. No, it, it was the, the notion that North Korea would suddenly start denuclearizing in a way that, you know, that Trump, et cetera, uh, at all expected, that would have been unexpected and scary. You know, what the hell's going on there? They're behaving in, in a way that we understand. We can trust that. Doesn't mean we can, we'd like it. Doesn't mean that we will accept it, but it, it means it doesn't surprise us. And, Surprise is what gets you in trouble at the international level. Um, so that's perhaps uh, relevant to what's going on today. I don't know if you saw uh, in, in the latest No Puppet, No Puppet, You're the Puppet moment um, from complaining about how, how Germany is completely controlled by Russia. What? Huh? <laughs> what? That was a thing. What, what was it? Standing up to them? Yeah. Enforcing the sanctions on Russia, Germany? Who said this? Uh, because Germany buys a lot of natural gas from Russia. Well, where else are they going to get it? He wants them to buy it from us, I guess. Uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, it's, it, and that it actually ascribes to rational emotive. Uh, I, th I think that it was very much, you know, Trump is... Um, embodies the, the notion that they that narcissists project onto others what they're what they're they themselves are doing um and so i think it was just that's on his mind so he's gonna he's gonna blame somebody else say somebody else is doing it and and i think trump's number one motivation the number one motivation is um attention oh. press attention global attention and Whatever he does, if you view it through the, the prism, view it through, through the lens of does this give him more eyes, eyeballs focused on him? Whatever choice he makes is going to be the one that, that has better ratings. And that doesn't, that doesn't mean approval, but it's attention. Yeah, remember, narcissists don't care about it. Negative attention is just as good to them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.
So Jamei, did you in your writing uh, address um, bipolar world, my multipolar world, like game theory? Because I, I remember I studied political economy extensively. And what it seems to me is all these bilateral agreements and breaking down multilateralism, which is mm -hmm. you know, like a game theory. It's a way to get lots of players to, to go one way. Whereas bilateralism, I mean, that's how World War I happened. Yeah. Did uh, I, I, I didn't. I limited limited on space. I have written about that. I, uh, did you ever read any of, of Ken Waltz's uh, Theory of International Politics, Man, the State, and War? Uh, it's sort of like the grand old man of, of international politics. Died a couple of years ago. I, I worked with him closely at, when I did my um, graduate work in international politics. And so, um, but this, the question of bi bipolar... Bipolar systems are very stable. Very stable, yes. Very stable, but um, which which doesn't mean they are peaceful necessarily. It means they don't fall apart easily. Multilateral systems are less stable, but um, can be more can be more peaceful if there are uh, if you but you have all these groups trying to basically balance out against each other. Um, I'm not. Uh, I actually don't think we're we're on the verge of any kind of shooting war. Um, I'm not worried about that, at least not anything cross border. Uh, it, it, I think shoot, any shooting war that happens that the U.S. will be involved in is most likely going to be internal. Um, you know, like that link I put in there, she talked about the how the institutions are degrading. How institutions that we create institutions and then we forget why we created them. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> there is a story that it's, it's apocryphal. I know this, this hasn't happened, but there is a story that I've seen time and again. You have a group of chimpanzees in a cage with a, um, a stack of bananas in the center. And anytime any of the chimps go after a banana, a remote hose squirt, uh, shoots water at them. And so they all avoid the banana. Um, and then you take one chimp out, put a new chimp, chimp in, and as soon as that new chimp goes after the you know, stack of bananas, all the other chimps jump on him to stop him, because they all, because they otherwise would all get sprayed. And then you keep selectively removing a chimp until, the, you know, as each one learns uh, that for some reason, even though they never get, these new ones never get sprayed, they attack the, the oh, anyone who goes after yeah. them. As soon as you have replaced all of the chimps, none of them have ever been sprayed, but all of them will attack the one, the new one that goes after the bananas. Again, I, there's no evidence that that experiment has actually been uh, undertaken, but it makes a nice kind of intuitive sense as understanding how these kinds of institutions become, um, we embrace them, but we don't know why. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> hey Susan, we're, um, we, uh, we're doing a check-in and uh, Jamey took us into trust and international relations. Then we started talking about anarchy versus chaos which led us into a variety of interesting, uh, interesting corners. I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> which we are only beginning to explore. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm all, I always bring such joy and, and fun to these conversations. You do. This is fun. Um, so a couple of thoughts from what you were saying, Jermaine. Um, one of them is that um, anarchism <clears throat> is one of those things that got demonized alongside socialism and communism. <clears throat> and very effectively demonized, like, don't look over there. These are terrible things. Nobody should be doing them. We will ostracize anybody who so much as contemplates these things. We did that really effectively. And I just want to read off in my brain, I have a thought called types of anarchism. So this is variance, right? So I have <clears throat> the following. Anarcho-capitalism, anarcho-communism, anarcho-pacifism, anarcho-primitivism, anarcho-syndicalism, Christian anarchism, collectivist anarchism, crypto anarchism, epistemological anarchism, free market anarchism, individualist anarchism, rational anarchism, social anarchism, synthesis anarchism, and tranarchists. And I'm probably missing a few. And each of these is a school of thought. Each of these, I didn't make these up. Each of these, most of them have Wikipedia page entries. Most of them come stem from somebody doing stuff. And friend, for example, one of the places I would love to go back in history is the Second Spanish Republic, uh, because there was a, a democratically elected government in Spain after World War I, 
that had a fantastic agenda. They were doing all kinds of cool shit, and they basically offended the royals, the aristocrats, the, the military, and the church, who then went and fetched Franco from Africa. And what you have then is the, the, the Spanish Civil War, which is the prelude or the practice arena for the Second World War, et cetera, et cetera. But I want to, but, but there's sort of anarchist kind of governance models and strategies that were in place in the Second Spanish Republic that I know only a tiny bit about. I don't even know where to look to learn more. But that has been so well squished out of history that we don't look there, we don't go for these models. And, and I think part of our explorations these days for how to govern, like, what, do, what does decentralized governance look like? Or what does a fractal uh, representative system look like? How do we uh, delegate and make decisions together? Should explore these spaces, because these are really, really fruitful avenues. But we have this problem that we've de demonized the very, the very topic. So part of this is a labeling issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is some, for someone else to check in. But yes, anarchism is actually an, an idealist philosophy. It is, it is. And I, I think that as the more that we link, that we, that we conceptually link anarchism to the various kinds of open source, open splat movements out there, the, the less scary it seems. Because all of these, you know, the failings or the, the weaknesses of open, of open source free software and the like, and the strengths map nicely to the failings and strengths of anarchic versus hierarchic regimes. It's interesting because a lot of these forms of anarchism are about um, self-governance or self-organizing systems or self-sovereignty or whatever. And then, you know, some of the crypto movements are moving toward self-sovereign identity, for example. That's interesting. That's kind of in this realm. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and actually, but, anarchy is a lot about trust. A lot. It's actually about we don't need the policeman with the cudgel and the laws and the rules and authority for over us all the time. You know, I'd settle for a policeman with a cudgel. I, what I don't want is the policeman in body armor with like submachine guns and a tank. Yeah, the militarization of the American police that is pretty. Clear. It's horrible. But the Peel principles that, that were the foundation of the Metropolitan Police in London were created by Bobby Peel, a minister of, of parliament. That's why um, police in England are called Bobbies. Um, and the Peel principles are all about this sort of nonviolent approach toward, toward stopping people. It's, it's partly why uh, the British, the, why the Bobbies are not armed. Because arming escalates. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm an amateur. Susan, yes, you're you're muted. However, yes, I was. Now you're muted. unmuted. <laughs> I'm unmuted. Um, in any of these explorations, um, have you come across, or has anybody tried to write about how how well these scale? Because I think they require a pretty high degree of um, social cohesion, and and that takes a lot of time and energy. Um, was, what was the saying? Who said, um, I love socialism, but it takes too many evenings? <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's, it's really like participation, yeah. civic participation eats time, right? It, it really does. And, and, and it does. It occasionally it's incredibly frustrating. Well, any kind of participation does. Right. I mean, so, so we've kind of outsourced all that to push button democracy that every four years we maybe push a button and then somebody goes and does a bunch of stuff and we don't have to worry about it so much except when we do have to worry about it so much, right? It's interesting. So, so the three, I've got an article in my head that I haven't written yet um, <clears throat> uh, titled Scale Kills. And uh, the, the, oh, that's the, a preamble, nice one. the preamble to it is basically the three words I've heard that have killed more good ideas in more companies and discussions are it won't scale. Uh, because generally when we say scale, we have an engineering mind about it. It's like, you know, Intel, when it figures out which fab to use, which, techno which technology to use for the next big fab, they run like a dozen lines in par parallel, pick the best one, optimize it, and then make everything exactly like that. They replicate it. Um, so it's, 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 I think they call it something like replicate exactly. Um, society doesn't work that way. So I'm really interested in what I think of as fractal or adaptive scale. Like how do we put 
guidelines out there that everybody can appropriate and, and, and adapt to their own situation that require them to get into a situation where they sort of trust each other, that they then can reach out and you know, touch the next community and see how that conversation goes and reach up to next layers of, of governance or whatever. But I, I think it's actually really doable from a, a social perspective. People uh, just need to, they need good examples of how this works and maybe a common platform to go talk on. That might help, although Facebook has become that platform, but you know, de facto. And Facebook has almost no awareness of, of its role in, in all of this. But I, I think that, that it's really doable, Susan. I don't, I don't I, 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 we, everybody doesn't need to be like spending every evening in these discussions, but if some proportion of our citizens actually participate and do this, it's good. Uh, in ancient Athens, uh, uh, the ministerial positions were done by lottery, by sortition. Uh, so, so every citizen could end up being just by chance uh, for a year, the minister of defense, the minister of economy or whatever the equivalent positions were in the Athenian uh, government. Yeah, isn't that why Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle obsessed on education? Because every citizen would end up in the government. Mm -hmm. So, Susan, I don't know if that runs again, runs counter to your experience yeah. on all these things or or whatever. I was I was just thinking about um, no, I was thinking about <coughs> something I didn't write a paper about about twenty five years ago. <laughs> but uh, we had for a while there we were working with um, at, when I was at IRL. Um, and, and we had a, uh, and I wasn't just doing management, we had a project with Steelcase and we were helping them develop, um, well, the underlying model that we were using was a, a social ecology that we were building. And we had, we had about, um, I'll, I'll hunt this up and send it around to people if they're interested, but we had about five or six different criteria that we had extremes on. Whereas if you, if you sort of, you know, plotted a pattern across those different, you know, parameters or dimensions, whatever you prefer, um, you had, uh, you had different things like, um, um, uh, gangs <laughs> where the cohesion was very, very, very tight. Mm -hmm. Um, and there were, you know, everybody knew each other and I don't know, it was just a whole bunch of those parameters that, uh, that had to be there, and I have never thought about whether any particular configuration was more likely to generate trust or not, and how that would be tested. I have no idea. But uh, the point was that the, dyna the dim dimensions and the dynamics of the social cohesion are the same whether or not we view the resulting entity or clustering as um, good for society or not, or for us or not, or for them or not. Or, yeah. yeah. So um, it, was, it was sort of... It was, uh, yeah. I, I see that in the, in the dynamics of the alt-right because um, people who might feel sort of lonely and outcast who then band together on Reddit and put in, you know, the next Pepe, the frog, um, GIF, uh, or GIF, whichever they feel like doing, um, and it goes viral. Uh, there's a feeling of camaraderie and bonding happening across people. There's, there, there, there's a feeling among them that they're part of an insurrection that is in fact changing the world. And that is creating the kinds of attachment and trust that you're talking about, except uh, I think not on a side I'd like to see grow. Right, but I think if we, if we want to deal with it, we have to recognize that, that, that the dynamics are the same. Yeah, exactly. Uh, sorry, Bo, you were jumping in. Susan, can you speak to, like, when I, I think a lot of us don't seem to realize that the lower part of our continent, South America, uh, we've got failed state after failed state, and the gangs you're talking about seem to be a, an organizing principle that's taking over governance throughout those states. Well, I guess one, one way of thinking about that is that with any, with any, with any social group, you will have you will eventually have politics. You will eventually have to have all of those, um, <clears throat> all of those different things. And so um, that they take over, well, in the case of, uh, in the case of the, uh, uh, the, um, the state, <laughs> the Iranian, the whatever that was, they, uh, they, they did take over governance of a, of a town when they moved in, right? Mm -hmm. And they did, they did govern, right, other people. 
Um, and, and yes, it's possible for anybody who's not part of that to feel left out. That's why participation, I've been interested for a long time in the, in the outcomes, different outcomes of participatory versus representative democracy. I don't actually think we understand very deeply what democracy means because <clears throat> some people, I think, a perfect democracy is where every citizen who should be voting voted. And, and voting equals democracy. No? Uh, well, to some. I mean, to some, a system in which there was 100% participation by checking boxes and putting in ballots equals democracy. <clears throat> and, and, and beyond that, there are representatives who should be doing your bidding. There's campaigning where they tell you what their platform, whatever, whatever. But that's, that's to some people a perfect democracy. Not to me, right? Those people who, aren't, who don't know anything, I prefer you don't vote. Please stay home. Well, there we go. <laughs> um, so, so, I mean, all of this about participation, about democracy, about how we govern ourselves is, is right, I think, right now up for grabs. I think, I think everybody's sort of looking around going, what the hell? Because I think on our last call, uh, part of the conversation was that a lot of uh, countries are heading toward authoritarian regimes that look and taste like democracy, but in fact, they've weakened the courts, they've weakened the press, uh, they've weakened the opposition. Look here at what Poland is doing right this very minute in Hungary, in Hungary and a bit in Turkey, uh, so that they, they can say, hey, we had elections and I won like a vast majority, so we have controlling interest in, in our version of parliament, and look, it's democracy. One of the wisest things that I, that I learned in graduate school in political science uh, was, the, was the statement, um, the success of a democracy is not determined by how you win, it's determined by how you lose. Mm -hmm. That is to say, whether you win by a plebiscite or whatever, that's not, that doesn't determine what is a democracy. It's whether you, it's your ability or the, the capacity of a, of a group to give up leadership, to give up all power if they lose whatever is the step towards, um, you know, how, how power is, is uh, exchanged. If you, can, if you are willing to and will uh, successfully give up power to the, to, the people, uh, to the next group, knowing that you'll have a chance again at some point in the future, that is a successful democracy. Um, it's yeah, not well, just, you know, do you, do you vote? It's do you, do you lose well? I'm curious what everybody on the call thinks a good democracy would be like. What, like what are the characteristics of a really great democracy? What, what, what are the traits that, that matter? Uh, Bill, do you want to jump in? I'm, I'm, I'm for a Can you move closer to the mic? Sorry. Is that better? A little bit. You're still kind of quiet. Um, there's a book called Ages of Discord, a Structural Demographic Analysis of American History. That was one of the first times that I ever ran into what I believe to be what's happening in the United States, which is com competition between elites. In other words, whether we like it or not, <clears throat> there are representatives of one group, call them Republicans, you know, or, or Wall Street people, etc., in another. And to the extent that they compete, they're not necessarily competing for the benefit of some population. They're competing for themselves. You know, I mean, one of the things that we get, uh, you know. Bill, we can't hear you. Yeah, you're really, really faint. I, and you're saying great stuff, too. Let me try. Uh, do you have an earphones? Can you plug yourself in? You know what might be happening? Is you might be plugged in, and you might just be away from that microphone because you're hearing noise now. Yeah. Is yeah. this any better? Oh yes, my God! Yes. Now you sound like you're inside my head. I didn't. I didn't realize. Yeah, that's that's what okay. was happening. Is that your headset was far away from your mouth? Right. Okay. So so the book is called Ages of Discord: A Structural Demographic Analysis of American History. And basically, what they're doing is going back and forth between, you know, what elites were in charge and 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 controlling. And in a way, what I see with the I'll, I'll use the term deplorables and everything relative to Trump is that they never had a representative. They never had a leader that would speak for them and like them. And so to the extent that they, that that comes up and he, he gets that kind of attention that Jamey was, well, that, that I guess 
uh, Bob was talking about. Some, somebody's bringing up the fact that attention is really what turns on Trump, not necessarily positive or negative, just attention. And so in that sense, he's leading a, a new segment of elite, which is that portion that wants control, that wants to be authoritarian, that feels that they're justified. Now, this is where I'd roll back into that book that I had mentioned some time ago uh, by Mark Bly, The uh, Great Transformations, which basically says that whenever you get into a troubled situation, A, it's complex, so nobody really knows what the problem is. And so if somebody comes up with a solution that sounds like it's going to, to work, they will allow institutions to start get, getting built around that so that the, they can try out that simplification process. In other words, that's supposedly what happened with the Keynesian economics and then the, 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 the uh, Heisek and, and Mount Freeman put together a group, the Mount Pelerin Society in 1945, and in essence began the process of waiting for the, quote, simplicity of the Keynesian pro program to fail so that they immediately in the 70s and 80s, once stagflation occurred, which couldn't be explained by Keynesian economics, they jumped in and started working that whole process so that they came up with a new simple answer, which was it's all about free markets. Now, it's interesting that somebody mentioned the issue with respect to Latin America. Well, it was almost precisely at that time that the Chile, Chile Allende situation was coming up, and Milton Friedman was lamenting the fact that he had no pure example of free markets. So they spent nine months before the CIA, knowing that the CIA was going in, University of Chicago spent nine months putting together a huge blue book or whatever they called it, which was the groundwork for how they were going to reorganize and take over and eviscerate any and all kinds of social services in order to get to a pure example of, of a, a free market free from any kind, even university students, it started immediately after Allende was, was, was pushed out and everything, they started to organize within the, the colleges. They ripped them, literally pulled them out of their, their classrooms and shot them. You know, they wanted nobody to believe that there was any value in social organization or social benefits. They took all of the union people, took them out of the country incarcerated them like in a, in a concentration camp until they agreed that they weren't going to they, they weren't going to compete with 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 Pinochet so in essence they got their ground zero and then they went from there to Uruguay to Bolivia to Argentina in other words this was uh, Naomi Klein's book the, the shock doctrine hmm. in other words and and even like within the last five ten years the IMF believes that they learned good stuff from that and that they had to use shock treatments in order to be able to get that. Now that to me reinforces the perception of the authoritarian concept, concept in other words, as the, as the next great transformation to simplify the process by saying, I'm in charge, get off the road. You know, whether that's with, with military equipment or words or, you know, the, the whole sort of Trump approach to lying about stuff so that he can re, refabricate the, 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 the rules. It, it's just a new methodology. Now, I say that as a preface to what I'm really working on, <laughs> which I'm, I'm hoping does have some value, but more probably in my 500 year plan. Um, there are two people that I'm studying with right now. Thomas Hubel, who who's, does the work with with William Urey on Meditate and Mediate, and he's got a new program out called The Hidden Law, which to a large extent, and, and How to Transform Stress. Those are three programs that I've, I've been working with him. And the fundamental aspect of what he's trying to get across is that we need to be more paying attention to all of our, our senses. In other words, not, it's what, what um, Gary Zukov called multi-sensory perceptions in his book, uh, Seat of the Soul and Spiritual Relationships. And, and it's really fascinating, and I could try and find the, uh, there was an interview that he had with Oprah Winfrey, which was very short, not more than like 10, 20 minutes or something. But she was sort of drawing out of him that 
a spiritual relationship, the way that Gary Zukov or Hubble would talk about it, is willing to challenge themselves with dealing with their projections, dealing with their anxieties, dealing with their problems. In other words, if I'm feeling upset by something you've said, I don't say, you did this. I say, I'm having this feeling, and the other person doesn't challenge them with, you know, you're wrong, you're misinterpreting. They say, where are you feeling that? And get, in, get the person in touch with what's going on so that they can get over it. The distinction that I thought was very, very healthy was the difference between a friendship and a spiritual relationship. In other words, a friend will try to, mo to uh, manage the situation so you don't get upset. A friend will really try to sort of like mollify it. They, they won't bring up the conflict, won't pull it out of you so that you can deal with it yourself. Whereas in the spiritual relationship, you're willing to take the challenge on of doing that. Now, my point there is that in essence, to get over this sort of search for simplification, the great transformations, you know, authoritarianism is going to work where all this mealy mouth, you know, NATO and, and all this kind of, you know, be nice to everybody while they're screwing you and taking all my money. And in other words, I think Trump actually believes that Europe is ripping us off. And the China is ripping us off. Everybody that's got a, a balance of trade deficit is ripping us off. Stop it. He doesn't understand economics at all to, to, you know, to, to really sort of support that, but he thinks it. And so his simplification is, if I'm an authoritarian and I don't want that to happen, I'm going to make that not happen. That, as somebody mentioned, is sort of like projection. You're, you're not taking facts into consideration. You're not dialoguing with the person. You're not feeling, figuring out where you're benefiting in the background, separate and apart from what they're benefiting from. So at the end of the day, there isn't the depth of relationship, the stuff that we're interested in. There isn't the depth of understanding how you have a conversation that is a complex adaptive system that allows for problems to come up, but it may not be you, what you're doing. I may think it's what you're doing, but it's what I think you're doing that's causing me to have a problem. It's that sort of I statement. In other words, I'm not trying to, to, to tell you that you did something you've got to fix. I'm saying I'm having a concern. Help me understand where my concern is coming from because it may be buried way in the past. has nothing to do with what's actually happening right now. Mm -hmm. my, my only point is that it, it, I think that the problems we've got are much, much deeper than just politics, you know, in its, in its simplest form you know, choice of red or blue or cho choice of, <clears throat> you know, liberal or, or conservative, that those aren't really the choices. It's whether or not you trust, which is obviously what we're trying to talk about here, the other person in that process really is a totally different. And this is what both Zukov and, and Thomas Hubel are trying to say that they believe, and I hope that they're true, they're right, that we're going through a time where individuals have got to realize the value of this and pick it up and start using it. The value of which part? The part of recognizing that the dialogue has to change. I think I had mentioned at one time there was a representative of the Dalai Lama that was picking up on the fact that there's so much demonizing of the other side that you can't get people to have a dialogue. But, but that's intentional in many cases because I agree. The, the I, breaking of dialogue is a tactic. It's a nasty ass tactic, but it's totally a tactic. Right. But, but we have to understand that for us to get back in the dialogue, yeah. we've got to show respect. Yeah. If there's no respect that the other person sitting there laughing saying, look, I got it. I, I, I got them, you know, doing it my way. I mean, to me, this is what the whole rapport between Putin and, and, Trump is that they they're they're liking each of them is liking the fact that that by destroying the other side they get a better shot at, at picking things up and, and doing it their way they're loving it yep yep so it's a and to me it's a deep problem but the you know if we're not going to solve it in our lifetime the least least we can do is solve it relative to ourselves 
you know, and start to, to adopt these new methodologies and new ways of communicating so that it creates exactly what we're trying to do, create, which is relationship. That's a very Rexy thought you're, you're mm -hmm. standing on there. Love that. Um, anyone else? What does this motivate for, for the rest of us? Because I'm, I didn't know about the blue book on Argentina and Chile and all that. I was Googling while you were, while you were talking. So I will have to go research that because it's called the shock doctrine by Naomi, Naomi Klein. I no, I know about that book, but, but you had mentioned a blue book. Uh, oh, well, that's, that's just what they created. Right. In other words, it was a, it was a, a model. It's right. mentioned, it's mentioned in her book. Um, well, I found a couple of references to the blue book on Argentina, which was created as a policy document, Chile, which, was then, right. which was then used for other countries near, you know, nearby, nearby. So right. super interesting and a little scary. Yeah. I think it's worth mentioning that the uh, shock doctrine book also describes how uh, essentially the Western oligarchs through the collapse of the Soviet Union managed to put in place the Eastern oligarchs, uh, and now we're reaping the fruits of that. That's right. very interesting. It's an, a, in soccer, you'd call that an own goal. <laughs> <coughs> very funny. Um, The good news is some people are actually working on reinstating democracy and trust and connections and uh, all the kinds of things that we're worried about. The bad news is uh, in, ma in many cases, their efforts are being swamped by this other mess that we're talking about. The maybe extra bad news is that the media seems mostly to be only interested in the disaster part of it. And so they're amplifying the disaster uh, by, by giving it a lot of attention, which is oxygen. Is it the media or is it the audience? The media is not helping. I don't, I, I don't think it's the audience. I think it's the media and their business model. Their business model is eyeballs over, over minutes, right? Right. Eyeballs and the eyeballs the audience. And so if, they are, if the audience wants the disaster, if they're more inclined to turn, tune in to read about, watch the disaster story than the, hey, look, at, then the Kumbaya story, then that's what they're going to do. If, yeah, and I, I have never been the, I've never been inclined to blame the media writ large for, for this. This is very, very much an intention problem, so what, whether so it's what neurological. Is responsibility? What, what is their responsibility here? Because if, if addiction is the goal and all we want, I mean, does the media have any social responsibility uh, around what they show? Because otherwise we're just going to like go right down the, the, the gutter into whatever the lowest common denominator of addictive media and, and uh, technology is and we'll be done. That's it. Media is a far too broad a term. When you, media, because you're when you say media, you're including everything from you know CNN to uh, no Marvel Comics to uh, you know to uh, EA Games. Well, I could I could put up a website that might go viral. I mean, Breitbart, for example, is media, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> wow, well, you can't really distinguish these things anymore so much. So, who, what is their responsibility? What is uh, our responsibility to them, Susan? I think you're muted. I am muted. I was just going to say, but I think that's always been true somehow. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the point I was trying to make before is still, we still haven't quite, I don't hear it being grappled with. We seem surprised that this happens when in fact it's always been happening. And, um, and we can't, I think, I think we have to think differently about the ways we can counter it because it's not just, you know, trust. I mean, these people trust Trump. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the trust, trust is not, alone is not going to, any of these things will not do it, right? Uh, and most people have, I mean, when you look at the things that make society cohere, I mean, a gang, which is a very strong kind of, you know, insists on allegiance, right? The Ten Commandments or any of those things are, are themselves the, of the same ilk. So we have to figure out how it is that we're, uh, you know, part of me wants to say, but then this is an oversimplification, that what we're talking about is inside versus outside, whether you're an insider or an outsider. That's also a dynamic that is at play. Because wherever you feel like you're an outsider, um, you know, then you will start to perceive power, you will start to perceive all these other kinds of things. It's not, I mean, we're not going to find one cause here, right? But that's part of the picture. 
it's a very powerful, you feel left out. You don't feel like you don't belong. You feel like your world is being dissed. You feel like, and it is. <laughs> That's the horrible part feel, uh, about all like burning it down. I'm not sure. Pardon? And they feel like burning it down because they're outsiders. I you can understand why. I can understand why, except I don't happen to believe in burning things down. And that's 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 a, that's something I don't know how one gets at, you know. But well, you can imagine, you know, you have to push yourself. Uh, well, I come from a Mennonite background, which is pacifist, and we used to argue all of these times, you know, forever about when do you resist. You know, do you resist, you know, and lived in a town where in the 50s, well, in the early 60s, in the middle of Kansas, you know, they, during the Vietnam War, the kids downtown would come out to the Mennonite community, haul the guys out of the dorm because they were pacifists and they were supposed to fight back and beat them up silly in the cornfields. Now, what do you do with that? I mean, uh, yeah, so I, so, so I think we have to, I feel as if the whole discourse that we have or things that we have like resistance and pacifism and none whatever and ever and all the rest of that stuff you can believe in that all you want to but you still have to make room for the fact that if you don't have some mechanism of inviting participation uh from others then um yeah i mean i lived in a closed a fairly socially closed community it worked beautifully for many things. It was very safe. Nobody went, right? Um, wasn't as extreme as the Amish where if you be misbehaved um, too much, you know, they would burn your barn down when then they would go back and build it up for you just to teach you a lesson. I mean, these are, these are very, to me, these are very familiar sorts of tactic and I, I find them, I, I don't, <laughs> So what's something nobody's thought of, I guess. Well, these, are, re these are recurring social dynamics. My question, the, one, the, one question that bubbled up as you were talking was, does there always have to be a sharp inside and outside? Why can't we all feel like we're in and in this together and trying to figure this thing out together? Because the moment we start drawing the inside and outside, whoever's outside is going to get revenge when they well, get Well, it's not back. about drawing. I think, I think what we're inside of these emergent phenomena just like trust and i think that it's you know oh i mean it starts with the strength of the ties right mm -hmm. cliques think about cliques think about girls cliques there's nothing almost nothing crueler than a girl's clique <laughs> but you know then the boundaries are so strong it's it's partly the strength of the boundaries it's partly uh, i don't know where to take that thought mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how Somebody do you recognize that I'm going to inject some humor. Yesterday, I watched George Cukor's The Women Again, you know, the 1949 movie. I love that movie. My God. <laughs> I, I, how, how, do you, how do you recognize that there is an out if everyone is in? I mean, do fish recognize they're in water? You know, the sort of the classic you know, construction of it. If you have no, if there is no way of defining out, then how can everyone be? Well, but you don't. It's not. A, it's not a definition, right? It's, it's, it's. You know, all boundaries are permeable or not. They're, they're. Uh, I mean, permeable to some degree. Um, you can. Well, I mean, this is a small. I mean, we learn these things in. We learn these social dynamics in grade school and in particular in high school. I mean, this is where adolescents form their identity and they, this business of being in or out of all these. All trying out all these different. You know being part of um you know if you the conditions for learning for instance socially social dynamics of learning are whether you want to be in and they want you to be in it's very hard to learn if if the people who hold the practice hold the hold the keys to the kingdom as it were um don't want you to be part of it so it's a mutual i think it's a mutual thing it's not like you it's 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 the nature of the relation you're in not the nature of the relationship well that just stunned us all into silence <laughs>
Well, you know, I've been part of this. <laughs> Relational thinking is tricky, right? Um, there's, there's this, I mean, we tend to in this, in this society, I mean, I just go on the, um, you know, I've been doing um, measure, measurement systems or trying to do them for a while um, that are based on, the, on the, um, the interaction, the quality of the interaction not the properties of the parties who are interacting. Just to try to get away from this either or two-sided kind of thing. What does that, to... that taught you? Oh, we're not very good at it. Hmm. Um, that we, in, in Western thought, I mean, that this notion of reification, which is defined in Western philosophy as, uh, you know, objectifying something that sh is not an object. Whereas that depends on, I mean, <laughs> sorry, this goes way back. Uh, that, that depends on your metaphysics, right? And your physics, actually. Whether you feel that, um, whether um, you feel that something is an object, whether, whether there are objects, let's just put it that way whether all of these things that we try to call objects, which seem so clearly to be an object, right? My phone, <laughs> all of these objects we have around us. And I remember thinking as a child, you know, well, once I started to learn about atoms and everything, and I kept moving the object to the end of the table, and I said, where's the end of the table? You know, where does the thing stop being a table? And where do, you know, I was driving myself nuts. <laughs> just, don't, just don't think about what the <laughs> actual length is. You know? <laughs> just don't think about what the actual length of a coastline is. Mm -hmm. Well, exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, I, I feel that, you know, I mean, we, we may mistake all kinds of things like we mistake precision for rigor. Mm -hmm. um, we don't, and those things are notoriously, I mean, belonging is, I mean, all of that stuff. We have such a trouble characterizing and we're only comfortable if it's numbers. I think we're just going to have to get over that. So there is rigor to be found. I guess that's one thing I've learned. There is rigor to be found and that in thinking of things as being relational, um, thinking relationally doesn't mean is, is, is to, to, to figure out what's in relation with what, what's the interaction like. Um, and for instance, this is really crazy. When I was at IBM, we put together a, um, a set of, you know, a model. I put together a model of transactional versus interactional interactions. Um, and you could, and you, in order to be able to t talk about the difference between um, uh, uh, transactional work and transactional interaction and interaction over time of the entities in the, in the system. So that part, what's interesting is if you were trying to figure out why it was that, you know, IBM's customers were uh, violating, uh, getting rid of their, breaking their contracts without there ever having been any indication of the, I mean, that was the puzzle any indication of um, unhappiness on the part of the customer. Well, all you had to do was study, you know, look at the nature of the interaction <laughs> between the different parties and what was dropped on the floor and not dealt with and all the rest of that sort of stuff. And everybody said you couldn't do it, but now you can actually. Hmm. You could have systems that, if you didn't, weren't terrified of them, <laughs> that looked at the, uh, the various qualities of the interaction for instance, whether it's um, civil or not, whether it's this or not, or something. So you're describing or sort of metadata about conversations, yeah. ab about pitch, emotional, valence, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. duration, intent intention insofar as you could infer it, uh, right. satisfaction, all those kinds of things. Yeah. And you have to be careful because, you know, we have a lot of interaction that isn't, that we don't, is not of our choosing. Right. And so... You know, if, and, and so you can have a dear, dear friend that you don't interact with for over a period of time. And as soon as you're with them, it's just exactly as if you'd never been apart. I don't know what that is. But yes, if you're, you've got it. I mean, you could, you could look at that interaction. You could determine the qualities of it. You could. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's a much more Eastern way of thinking. For sure. Um, That's funny. Uh, when I did the talk on trust at the Personal Democracy Forum, I started with the framework. Uh, usually there's a, kind of a triad 
that's uh, that's used for for what trust is. But then you can also split it. You can basically split it into kind of intellectual trust, which is you know I trust that this thing is going to happen again. Uh, and then uh, effective trust, which is whether you have the warm fuzzies about the person. And the effective is why you know you working <laughs> late at night with with Asian business partners before you ever talk business. That's right. Because they need to figure out who you are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's um well, and there's I mean if you just look at English language, you know you have to be careful because well, you know we have trust that something will happen. We trust in something. We trust someone. I have trust. I have, or I, this whole weird one, I have to trust them because there's no other choice, mm -hmm. which I find odd given the nature of trust. But we, we do that all the time. Well, that's an act we of have faith. We trust at our some children point. when we send them off, you know. Right. They go off on their own. Yep. Somewhere there's a, there's a link over to acts of faith. Like, you know, we, we, we make a whole bunch of acts of faith every day. There's a, a bunch of physics that we depend on that we don't expect is going to break tomorrow. And then there's social physics right. that sort of behaves the same way until it doesn't. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, I, you know, yeah. but I, 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 you know, we're finding out physics, physics is not all that clear cut either. So yeah, that's I'm true. I'm not too worried. I mean, I think the social physics, the social physics is really strong. <laughs> that's what, that's what we have to understand. Well, social physics is strong with this one. Um, so I think Trump is very trustworthy to his followers right now. He, oh, yeah. No, that's evangelicals trusted. are in love with Trump because his, he has had the biggest payoff so far for two years of effort of any Republican in the last 50 years. The, even the people in the, the heartland who are already being hurt by, by the tariffs still support him because they trust that he knows what he's doing. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, and that, uh, yeah, back in the, what was the Hillbilly's Elegy, there was some explanation about um, what it was like to not be, and there are articles too, I had to in the moment about what it is to, tr to trust, <coughs> trust in someone so much that you, you know, we're outsourcing trust, kind of. Very we're much building, so. We're not building it, right? Mr. LaForge, where's, where does all this conversation put you? Hello, everybody. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. Make it a little lighter, please. We're well. Yeah, I've been here just sort of interloping, just watching. I've been out of Rex for so long. It was fun just to see how the flow of the conversation goes and to, to not interrupt that. So thanks, everybody. I heard a lot of very interesting things. Um, and just in that last part, Susan, that you were talking about this idea of, do you really know somebody, like somebody you haven't seen in a long time, and you mentioned that you instantly feel good to them. Uh, in I Am a Strange, Strange Loop, Hofstetter has a, he kind of goes into this digression where he talks about how his wife, who recently passed away, really he, in every instance after she died, he would go, I know exactly how she would have acted in this situation. He's, he talks about how he can run this subroutine in his brain that is her. And he gets into this very medical physical. Does she exist? If I'm actually running that program so nearly to who she really is in my head, does she actually exist in my head? Mm -hmm. But there's, those are all fun things to consider. I think earlier in the conversation, I was much more interested in some of the, um, how do we trust each other in a chaotic system? If you see what I put in the chat right there, this idea that... Putin has really learned with his political technologist how to create a chaotic system. And when you can have, you don't know which opposition parties are real or fake. You don't know which news is real or fake. When you can't, when you, the same person who is supposed to be the expert is spouting completely opposite things, contradicting themselves all the time. What you're doing is you're putting us, everybody in a situation where you, it's very difficult and it takes so much effort to determine what is truth most people are simply going to throw their arms up and say, you know what, I'm opting out. I don't need to be engaged in politics, which is a wonderful outcome if you're Putin. If you're, if you're the person who's trying to run the system, the fewer people involved in it, the fewer you have in opposition to you implementing your own ideas. And I think a lot of that same playbook is exactly what I'm seeing with, um, with Trump. I do believe that at the surface level, he is a trying to just get attention, but he's trying to get intention with intention and that intention is this creating this system because 
while you're trying to spend all your time figuring out what he's up to, you're not doing anything else. Or it's causing more people to just say, I can't deal with this guy. I'm getting the hell out of this. Um, but there's also another psychological response people have in that situation, which is, uh, I can't remember, I think it was Sir Francis Bacon said something about you either, um, you have one of two mentalities when you're listening to something. You're either asking yourself, must I believe it or can I believe it? In Trump's support, in a chaotic system, you just look for the person that you just want to be telling the truth. I don't care if it's true or not. I do want America to be great again. That's the guy I want to be telling the truth. So the fact that it, others can prove that he's not actually speaking truth doesn't matter to you. You're wanting him to be truthful, to be telling you as it is, that I can fix everything is enough. Um, but I, you know, that to me puts a lot of, I don't see Trump as a, a, a bright guy per se, but it's an extremely intelligent strategy. And I have a difficult time wondering how could somebody like him actually be implementing and choosing to implement this strategy? Or does he have others who are with him helping him to do this? And that's where you can make yourself sick, just trying to come up with all sorts of conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. so, much of, so much of what's happened through and with Trump seems intentional in retrospect because too many things had to fall in place by accident for it all to have worked out just like hmm, randomly casually. Um, and I don't mean that like there's a perfect master plan rolling out. I just mean that I think a lot of what's happened has been very intentional and not merely serendipitous or accidental. I, I find that it's safer to think about Trump as being actually very um, cunning. So, you know, whether or not you want to grant him the, 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 the title intelligent, um, he's very cunning. I've gotten and into a couple difficult conversations trying to say that he's in some form or another smart. And that, that didn't work. So cunning, cunning, good word. Um, and, and there is, I think we have, especially those of us of, the, of this particular, of our particular political persuasion, um, we grant a lot of value to intelligence and we don't want to see our the people who are behaving in ways we find reprehensible and stupid. We don't want to see them as intelligent, even if there's good reason to believe that they are. Um, so that may be what you're encountering, Jerry. Mm -hmm. uh, but while there's certainly evidence of that there are people behind the scenes operating, operating with Trump. And, you know, I saw someone raising a really good question. You know, why do we, why do we act as if the Russian influence on the, uh, the 2016 election started with the, the actual final election and didn't start with the, um, uh, the primaries? You know, Trump emerging out of the pool of, of what, 16 different Republican candidates? Um, you know, it's, it's really, it's nice and, re and reassuring to think, well, there must be somebody behind that. Um, it's also, but it's useful, strategically, I think, useful to think, okay, well, what if the, he is the person who's thinking this through, that he has spent however many years um, as a media figure, and he has learned, you know, intellectually, viscerally, whatever, how to play that game. You know, his, his behavior around... Um, running the country is very much what you'd expect from somebody running a privately held business. You know, authoritarian control from the top, wanting to, you know, not wanting to have any losses around them. You know, they don't want to have a, a negative balance of trade because if, you're have, if you have a business, you'd want to be spending more than you're taking in. You know, it's very simple you know, approach, but if you think, think of it that way, a lot of his stuff makes a kind of sense. Um, and you couple that with this desire for attention and a recognition of how to play that game, how to get the attention. Um, I don't necessarily need, I don't think you need a conspiracy theory to recognize that he, that there is a larger game being played and we're playing into it. You know, when we focus on crazy statements, uh, I just had a, a news blurb pop up on my screen that uh, Trump is now demanding that NATO allies boost their defense spending to 4%. Wow. Yeah. It's only supposed to be 2%, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, doubling when they're, when they're still under 2% mostly. Wow. Yeah. 
Um, you know, so we focus on the crazy statements and, you know, don't pay attention to, to other stuff because we, we have a limited amount of time. There are a limited amount of eyeballs in each of us. I do this every time, just really just kind of bring everyone down. No, no, not at all. I, th I think we're, we're like, we've gone around lots of interesting turns in the road here and we're all kind of thinking about it. Um, would anybody like to put a different object in the room, like a different uh, a thing to chew on briefly and then we can um, wrap our call? Oh, was there something on your mind? You were just nodding? I'm, I have like an auctioneer's attention, so. Well, I, I have two more books to read from Virginia Woolf. I'm reading uh, Night and Day. I'm almost done with it. So, and I, I really love her mind. She's so beautiful. Uh, she's, she's quite the original feminist, too. And she didn't like being called a feminist, either. So right now, in this book, she's tearing apart the idea of love, and she's trying to figure out a way for a woman to have a relationship and not lose her freedom, mm -hmm. which was a great concern in her own life. Yeah, and that of her husband and her. So it's just, I'm just enjoying her right now. That's where I'm going to go for the rest of the day. Awesome. The Cougar movie you watched was that Little Women? Oh, The Women. George Cukor, 1939. Oh, women. Okay. Oh, Joan Crawford. Oh my God, it's all women. There's not one man in the whole movie. And uh, he had all the biggest female movie stars of the time in that movie, and it's amazing. They've tried to make it again, but it was never as good as the 1939 version. Fascinating. Thank you. I didn't know about this movie. <clears throat> and even the dogs are female in the movie. I mean, there's no men ever. It's wonderful. At least in front of the cameras. Right. Yeah. Visible in the movie. Um, well, cool. I, anybody want to take with the conversation we were in any further or drop anything else in? Otherwise, um, I might read the poem again oh, that's good. and take us out. We're good. Um, Jimmy, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll take a swing at the poem Please at do. the end here. Please do. Uh, it was titled, Who Burns for the Perfection of Paper by Martin Espada and goes as follows. At 16, I worked after high school hours <coughs> at a printing plant that manufactured legal pads, yellow paper, stacked seven feet high and leaning as I slipped cardboard between the pages, then brushed red glue up and down the stack. No gloves, fingertips required for the perfection of paper, smoothing the exact rectangle. Sluggish by 9 p.m., the hands would slide along suddenly sharp paper and gather slits thinner than the crevices of the skin, hidden. The glue would sting, hands oozing till both palms burned at the punch clock. 10 years later in law school, I knew that every legal pad was glued with the sting of hidden cuts, that every open law book was a pair of hands upturned and burning. Good one. That's a lovely one, yeah. Thank you all. Uh, Thank you. Fun and fabulous call. Thank you for checking in like this. Uh, let's be careful out there. Will do. Bye. Bye. Bye.